It's time for the 1430 Connection on 1430 WNAV and 99.9 FM. Spotlighting news, newsmakers, and important community issues. Now, with this week's edition of the 1430 Connection, here is WNAV news anchor Donna Cole. Welcome to the 1430 Connection. I'm Donna Cole in the studio with me today. I welcome Ann Colt Lightus, and she has been elected as our state's attorney here in Anne Arundel County. You are the very first woman state's attorney in now a 95-year history of the office. You were originally appointed to the position back in 2013, and thank you for joining me again. Thank you for having me. Uh, so 2018, this has been, this was kind of a, a an interesting election. It was. And the women that have run, I've heard two things from them. They either really don't like the term pink wave or they really do embrace it. What do you think? I embrace it because I was looking for that in 2014 because women were very interested in um, politics in 2014. But if people don't come out and vote, you can't have any any kind of uh, change. So um, the momentum built after 2014, and I think we saw it in 2018, not just that it was a pink wave, but people in general were very interested in this election. And it is interesting, the first, you've, you've broken a glass ceiling again. For, you broke the glass ceiling initially when you were appointed, now very much the second time around. What does this mean to you? Uh, it means everything to me because I spent my entire career in Anne Arundel County State's Attorney's Office just working as hard as I possibly could. I think I had to prove to myself and prove to others that I was a good attorney. And this is just the culmination of all those years, of probably 27, 28 years now of hard work. And it's interesting, you're surrounded by men at home. I am. Unless one of your new cats is a uh, female. <laughs> I do have a female cat <laughs> and a female dog, but okay. uh, yeah, a, a house full of men. Three sons, husband, yes. ages of the sons? So my oldest son is about to turn 25 on Sunday, the day before I'm sworn in. Nice. And then my middle son is 23, and my youngest just turned 18. He's a senior in high school. Okay, because I don't know you, and I'd like to get to know the people I'm interviewing, yeah. you knew this question was coming. I didn't give you a lot of warning <laughs> a little bit. Favorite book, favorite song, and favorite movie? Oh, my goodness. It's hard to narrow down movies, but I like... Um, I like the movie Rain Man. Mm -hmm. I like uh, the movie The English Patient, The Verdict. Mm -hmm. um, that you speaks know, to the law. It <laughs> speaks to the law. I love the song Naive Melody by the Talking Heads because huh. it talks about home. This must be the place. Uh -huh. Um, and book, my goodness, I am not prepared for that. I think about childhood books that, that really touch me. Um, Watership Down, I read as a, a young adult. And some of the children's books that I read to my uh, kids um, really strike a chord that talk about family. Went to Laurel High School, went on to Westchester University. That's in uh, Pennsylvania? Yes, it, right okay. outside of right uh, Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And then University of Baltimore Law. What doesn't your bio say that people should know about you? And I do know one thing, because uh, we, we just discussed this. You like animals a lot. Mm -hmm. You cannot look at your social media, whether Facebook or Twitter, and not see uh, chickens, cats, dogs, <laughs> horses, you name it. You just did adopt two cats. We did. We um, It was almost like a reward for all the hard work. My husband kept threatening to get a cat, that he was just going to come home with a cat. And um, that was not an idle threat because he does that sometimes. <laughs> he just comes home unannounced with an animal. Uh, he's done that to me twice. And so he kept threatening to get a cat. So um, about three or four weeks ago, my husband and my youngest son went to Petco. Mm -hmm. And they adopt cats there. And they identified a cat, a kitten, who had you know one of her eyes was a little cloudy and she had had an, an illness as a, a very young kitten and they talked about her they wanted to adopt her so they brought me back a day or two later there she was and then we saw a six-year-old cat too Aww. So and we, we couldn't say no we couldn't say no so and their names now because i know you well we, <laughs> we debate we debate the names <laughs> still don't have a name one is bob okay uh the boy is bob and um the girl is either zonk or carmino everybody calls her a different name so and then we have a little we have a um, a 14 year old yellow lab named gracie okay mm -hmm. what else do should people know about you that's not written in your bio i love movies and i can pretty much identify anybody in a movie in their other five ten movies they've been in i'm a really good cook i bake i think baking is therapy um, my family accuses me of trying to fatten them up pretty much i have been cooking and baking for the last two weeks before the holidays and i announced to my family yesterday i was done i made them a great big meal and i said you're on your own now is that stress relief for you <laughs> being in the kitchen i think it is i think uh, cooking and baking and also cleaning you know i think it's also a distraction from other work that you have to do um, i think i procrastinate sometimes 
and uh, cooking, baking, cleaning um, is cleaning, a way to huh. cleaning. Yeah, <laughs> ask anybody who's preparing for like a big trial that their office is meticulously clean, right? It's right. Like, because you have to get all that clutter out before you can focus on what you need to do. So, I've been my I've been cleaning my house a lot, getting everything ready for my new job. <laughs> and okay. Keep my and, mind clean. and you're ready for the new job. And has West been helpful? He has been. He has been. We've uh, talked on the phone a few times. Mm -hmm. We've texted. Uh, we've emailed. They've given me a lot of information. But, you know, it's very hard to prepare for this because until you're actually in the office and talking to people and meeting with them, you know, everything else is sort of on paper. Right. So. Okay. So, uh, yeah, on Monday, the public is invited to this. Yes, absolutely. you're being sworn in at the Anne Arundel County Circuit Courthouse right here in Annapolis. It's at 5 o'clock? Five o'clock. So the clerk of the court, the brand new clerk of the court, Scott Poyer, will swear me in. There'll be a few speeches from friends and colleagues, family members. I'm going to have my three sons yeah. uh, give a little speech together, oh. and uh, hopefully they'll they'll do a good job. And then that'll be it. It'll be from 5 to 6 p.m. All right. We're going to take a quick break. More in a moment with Ann Colt Lytus. This is Donna Cole on the 1430 Connection. We will be right back. Welcome back to the 1430 Connection. I'm Donna Cole. I am in the studio today with Ann Colt Lightus. She is the first woman elected to the state's attorney's position here in Anne Arundel County in 95 years. That's crazy. It is. I mean, it is actually crazy. And we were just talking about the people that, um, you know, I was with, with the books or the movies, or artists, our favorite people. For me, it was always men, and now I question, why not women? And you said, well, it's who we were exposed to. We didn't learn about women in, in these big positions. When we think about the word doctor, uh, I think of a man. Yeah. Um, and that's just because I had male doctors. It's changing. There are a lot of women judges now. There are mm -hmm. a lot of women judges on the circuit court bench. And there are a lot of female attorneys in the state's attorney's office. And uh, the prosecutor's office seems to lend, lend itself to a great place for women to work because... Unless you're in court, you can have a family. If you have a big case, then your family may be not getting as much attention. You know, your your spouse, your partner has to step up and help your family members. But generally, it's a good place for women to work if you want to have it all or try to have it all. All right. So you wrote an editorial that ended up in the Capitol, I guess, for uh, why you're running back in November, possibly? Yes. This is on the topic of checks and balances. I cannot stand by while Wes Adams blows his budget by more than $1 million for non-crime fighting purposes, like unauthorized raise it, raises, inflated salaries, and campaign-style giveaways with his name on them. Million-dollar taxpayer bailouts are not acceptable for elected officials. Adams grossly mismanaged the county's largest law firm, the state's attorney's office, I did a better job and will do a better job again. Are there not enough checks and balances? Well, it didn't seem like anybody reigned uh, in the spending last time. When I was state's attorney, it's a funny story, I tell it a lot. When you come towards the end of the budget, invariably you run out of money or you see what's coming and if you spend any more, you will run out of money. Right. We would lock the supply cabinet. You know, we would ration paper. We actually moved to an electronic um, docket system internally in the state's attorney's office to save paper. Mm -hmm. We would print out a docket for every attorney. It would be on their desk every day. We, we stopped that because we just couldn't waste paper right. we had, because we were in a tight budget. And when you give a raise to somebody, you have to make sure that you have money there. So the prior administration, when they were authorized to give a 2% raise, they gave a 3% raise. When someone leaves that's making $100,000, you can't hire somebody in their spot and pay them $120,000. You're immediately over budget. When a person leaves the office, it takes about a month or so for all that money to be paid out for their vacation leave, their sick leave, and their last paychecks. So you think you're going to be more fiscally conservative? Uh, that's how I was raised. I was raised by people who lived through the Depression, my mm -hmm. grandparents and my mother. Do they, sa frugal. do they save everything? They save, they recycle, they, you know, they would buy nice things and they would go on nice vacations, but boy, they saved and they were very, um, they pinched pennies. And I'm like that too, to, the, to a fault sometimes. I, I laugh at myself when I see myself doing that. But that's who I am. And this is a public office. It's the largest law firm in Anne Arundel County. It has a $10 million budget now, 55 lawyers, about 118 employees. 55 lawyers. 55 lawyers. That's a lot of lawyers. It is a lot of lawyers. Are so you planning on keeping them all? 
Well, hopefully I'll keep the ones that want to stay. You know, there will certainly be some change. Um, you know, some people won't want to stay because they different boss. Absolutely. So, you know, it's not my style to come in and clean house. Uh, I don't think it's appropriate. These are um, these are public servants, and um, you know, there'll be people. There'll be differences and changes. And um, you know, I, I'm also a big fan of it's not. If it's not broken, don't fix it. Well, you did write in the same editorial, I cannot ignore that thousands of cases are dropped each year, including one in four DUI cases and 90% of drug driving cases because prosecutors are no longer trained and are unprepared to face veteran defense attorneys. So you're saying right there, there's a problem with the attorneys that are in there. Well, I'm saying there's a problem with training. Somebody told me once, um, that I guess the general public thinks that when you go to law school, you come out and you're ready to do anything or try anything. But it takes, I'd say, six months to maybe up to even a year to train a prosecutor fully to be able to be in court and to handle cases. And I remember when I was a brand new prosecutor, we would come home, my husband and I, we were both prosecutors, we would come home and we would just be exhausted at night because it was so mentally challenging. It was a lot of hard work to learn the ropes. And so it's unfair to attorneys to throw them into court. To the wolves, throw them to the throw wolves. Throw them to the wolves and not have them highly trained. And, and are most of these attorneys in there straight out of law school? Well, the ones in the district court are. And, you know, when you have a stable office, it takes about at least a minimum of it, one to two years to make your way from the district court up to the circuit court to try cases. When people are moving through quickly because people are leaving or being fired, then you're having brand new attorneys up trying felonies, and that's not fair to the public. It's not fair to the attorney. Against seasoned defense attorneys. Seasoned defense attorneys who know all the tricks. You also wrote, I took steps to improve what was then one of the most respected offices in Maryland. I won grant funding to fight gun violence, established a community outreach program that continues to this day and upgraded technology. You took grant funding to fight gun violence. We mm -hmm. can't talk about specific cases, but uh, gun violence is going to be on your radar in the next, uh, within the next few months. Absolutely. Um, what people uh, may not know is there is a lot of federal and state money the governor's crime control and um, prevention, as well as federal grants that allow prosecutors to hire staff, uh, such as prosecutors, to fight gun violence. And any felony that is committed where a gun is used, that's an automatic five-year jail sentence. Mm -hmm. uh, it becomes very, very difficult when you have a 19 or 20-year-old committing a crime with a gun, and they're facing five years in prison for just for having the gun alone. Um, but that is a problem because we don't want guns in our community being used um, by people to commit felonies. And do you see uh, adding some people to the office just to fight maybe one or two cases coming up that have some gun violence within them? Well, you know, there are some very talented people in the office right now, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm aware of them. I know who they are. If they stay, you know, they're welcome to be on my team. It's just very, very talented people that, you know, you want to keep, you want to cultivate. You want an office where people stay. Some prosecutor's offices, people come and they stay a year or two, they get their training and they leave. There's always going to be a portion of that, maybe less than half, maybe a third of those folks will just come through. And the rest will want to stay and they'll want to move up and they'll want to do the big cases. So I'm focused on getting those people who, who become career prosecutors. We're going to take another short break. We'll be right back on the 1430 Connection. Welcome back to the 1430 Connection. I'm Donna Cole. In the studio with me today is our, about to be our state's attorney in Anne Arundel County, Ann Colt Lytus. She's getting sworn in on Monday. Uh, here again, I know that you can't talk about individual cases, but I worked for the Capitol. I lost friends uh, back in June. And how are you prepared for this trial? Well, I am the kind of person who uh, prosecutes cases fully. I am known for being extremely well prepared, leaving no stone unturned. And I think that that's the way that I approach every big complex case that I've ever had is I try and make it that I know more even than the police know about the case. I go, I, I go behind the evidence to see, you know, what is this motivation? What is the background? Why did this happen? And I became very well known for my ability to take difficult cases and win them, mm -hmm. circumstantial cases. I used to joke um, with the former deputy state's attorney, can you can you please actually give me a case with a confession? Because they would never give me a case with a confession. They would give me the case that was a who done it or why, you know, why done it. Um, and that's good because that actually made me a better lawyer 
and and to work on those cases. So uh, when I was state's attorney before interim state's attorney 2013 to 2015, I actually prosecuted two murders while I was state's attorney. So which is unusual. You it's just unusual. told me before. Pretty Normal. unusual. Yeah. yeah. Some some uh, state's attorneys are, are merely managers or administrators, and some are the manager slash you know prosecutor, but. Um, you know, the people who are coming in with me are already warning me and saying, please, Ann, you know, don't take on too many cases uh, because that's what I'm known to do. I did that in Baltimore when I was the head of a uh, special victims unit. It was very difficult for me to see a case and give it to somebody else. If I knew it was challenging or difficult to win, I was willing to take it on so myself. Have you been briefed on this case? I have been briefed on the case. I've had a meeting and I've been given the, enough information that I need at this point. Yes. Okay, so going back to that comment that you had written about uh, 90% of uh, drug, or one in four DUI cases and 90% of drug driving cases are dropped because prosecutors are not trained. We've seen some of these horrific accidents, including uh, on Route 50, a woman killed by a repeat offender, multiple offenses in Queen Anne's County that Queen Anne's County Sheriff's Department said, hey, we did our job. The courts didn't. How do you stop this? How do you, I mean, with, with this opioid epidemic? So it's very easy, I think, for one agency to blame another, right? right? And, I, and I find that extremely distasteful, you know, for the police to blame a prosecutor, not that that's what they happened in this case, but for police to blame prosecutors, prosecutors to blame police, people to blame the court system. You know, the court system and law enforcement cannot solve all of society's ills. We just can't. There will always be people who go out and commit these horrific crimes. But what I want to focus on um, for these cases, for these drunk driving and drug driving cases, is holding people accountable. We have to do that. We have to support law enforcement to go out there and, you know, to stop people who are swerving down the road. What I saw when I was running for election, when I looked at the evidence of the district court statistics and the police statistics, is that we used to have something like an 86% conviction rate for DUIs, and it dropped down to 75% in the last couple of years in the prior administration. So like, what is that about? Is that poor police work? Is that poor prosecutors work? What is going on? Mm -hmm. And at the same time that we saw this, we saw that prosecutors were no longer being formally trained. And DUI cases, to prosecute those cases, it's a niche. And you have to know how to do that. You have to know how to go into court and prove to the judge, because it's a judge trial in the district court, that this person is under the influence of drugs or, or right. alcohol. Um, so you have to train people to do that so that the people are held accountable because you don't want someone, the worst thing is to, to someone who has committed these crimes to not be held accountable. Right. Because we want them to change their behavior, right? So if you don't change the behavior, we have these horrific accidents. Um, the drug driving cases, one of the one of the things that I have seen where the law is not caught up with practice and, and the reality is that when people use drugs, it's very difficult to prove that they are under the influence at the time that they're driving, right? The police need to have the tools to do that, and they need to have drug recognition experts. We need to have laws that permit the police to direct someone to have a blood test to prove that they're under the influence. So those are very difficult cases to prove. And, um, you know, with the legalization or the decriminalization of marijuana, you know, proving that someone is under the influence of marijuana or other drugs, it's become a little bit more complicated. Mm -hmm. Your job is now starting Monday to keep us as safe as possible. Are you ready for that? I, I am. Um, I internalize this. It matters to me very much. Um, I consider the state's attorney's office and being the state's attorney a calling. I don't consider it a political platform. I'm not a terribly political person. I've had to become a political person and I ha I've had to embrace it. I really think it's all about competence and having the best people to do the job. People who, one died in the wool prosecutor will recognize another one they know who's committed to it it's this is not just a job it is you know trying to keep people safe and holding people accountable holding people accountable comes in many forms it comes in you know removing violent people from society it also comes in the form of doing justice and you know getting rid of cases that are improperly charged or wrongfully charged or you know it's not the person who committed the crime it also comes in the form of offering rehabilitation mm -hmm. and treatment and counseling to people who can be helped. And, and, you know, we don't want to throw people away because, again, the collateral secondary consequences is that person has a family. They have children. 
You know, they have a job. Right. And, uh, you know, we do better as a society if people are functioning. Anne, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. This went very quickly. I told you it was. <laughs> thank you for inviting me. I look forward to representing Anne Arundel County. This is Donna Cole on the 1430 Connection. We will see you next week.